Greetings. <laughs> Should I put a little more growl into it? <laughs> okay, I came yeah. back to we spent 48 hours making puppets. <laughs> <laughs> making and breaking hearts, Ellinger. It's not that kind of podcast. On a practical level, <laughs> I have to remember what I was saying on a practical level. We should have a safe word. <laughs> Armageddon! I guess we're maybe semi-proud of that. Welcome to Hide and Create, your online writing workshop. Welcome back to Hide and Create. This is Moses Siragar. I'm with Diana Rowland, Jordan Ellinger, and Joshua Esso. And today, we're going to talk about what not to do in publishing. Uh, probably a very long list of what not to do in publishing, uh, but we'll try to keep it brief. Um, Diana has been around the publishing block a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I tend to go uh, with the Will Wheaton law. Of, uh, don't I'm not sure if we're allowed to say this word. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Don't be a dick, uh, and that applies really, really broadly. Uh, don't don't be a jerk or a dick to anyone, even if it's just the little intern. Even if they're t- giving you really bad news, you suck it up and smile um, because that little intern may be the owner of the publishing company uh, later on. Um, there's just no reason for it, and you're going to make a you're going to get a whole lot farther being nice, being understanding, being gracious. Um, People will go the extra mile for you if you accept some crappy thing that comes down graciously. Not saying that you have to suck it up, uh, but like say that uh, the production editor emails you and say, oh my God, we're having to push back your book by two months and the artwork is this and that. Instead of going off on the production editor say, oh man, that, that's, that's really hard to hear. Uh, I know this isn't your fault. Is there anything we can do? You know, be gracious and a professional about it. And then, hey, they're going to go the extra mile to make stuff work for you. So yeah. that's my biggest rule is don't be a dick. Yeah, I think uh, we've, we've talked about don't be a dick before. And I mm. think like we it, could actually it create, <laughs> we, 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 yeah, we could create like a, a hide and create sort of logo with a, a penis in a circle and a, and, a, <laughs> and a red line going through it. And, and like that could be like our thing. Don't be a dick. I think, I think that would be misconstrued by some people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might get us banned on some wow. of our publishers. Hide yeah. and create. We are um, anti-penis. <laughs> it, 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 it certainly, it certainly I, bears repeating. <laughs> Yes. Um, I think a, a kind of addendum to the don't be a dick thing is Gaiman's Triangle. Have you guys heard of that? Mm-hmm. I, I have, but it's a good one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Gaiman's Triangle is basically, um, in order to succeed, uh, there, there are three qualities that, that help you succeed. Basically being nice, being quick, and being good. And those are the three legs of the triangle. Now, you can succeed with two of them, right? You can be nice. But those two have to be really, nice. really strong, it though. It can't be like a weak ones. Yeah, sure, sure. Being nice and quick. I mean, sometimes you read, like, as a tie-in writer, there are tie-in writers that are nice and quick, and they do get work, and those are the tie-in books that give tie-ins <laughs> that name. <laughs> you know, you can be you can be uh, quick and, and talented, right, and uh, be a total jerk, because people are like, but oh, you have to be- I hate dealing with this guy, but he gets it on time. This yeah, book. this thing, you have to be really talented. Like yeah, exactly, right? So And so on, right? But but you can't just be one. You can't just be nice <laughs> because if you're awful and slow. Yeah. See, see my attitude is um, be all three. <laughs> then then you you have a really good strong solid base. You know uh, you know three legs yeah. is better than a two legged stool. Uh, so you, yeah, yeah, you can yeah. succeed with just two, but I don't think you can excel with just two. I guess a, a two legged triangle is just a V. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think if you if you do all three, you're you're sort of building your personal Voltron, right? So <laughs> you like the lions. So. <laughs> that is my new favorite expression: <laughs> building your personal Voltron. <laughs> that needs to be a self help book. <laughs> I love it. So I mean, yeah, but you know, you can look at yourself and go, okay, am I being nice? Okay, check. Am I writing well? Okay, I hope so. And uh, I don't want people to think that, that uh, being quit. nice means, means sucking up the bad stuff. I mean, you don't always have to be, you know, goody two-shoes, but you do have to be understanding and gracious and at least, you know, don't take it out on people who don't deserve it and that sort of stuff. And yeah, when I mean, you do have to be a jerk, you let your agent be a jerk. Nice. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, just like I look at myself and I go, okay, nice. Okay, I think I got I think I'm pretty good at that. Good. I, ho- I hope I'm good at that. You know, and then quick. Well, okay, I got to work on being quicker. You know, I, get, I mean, I think another time you had said it as like being on time. I don't know if Gaiman's thing was quick or if it was like being on time, meeting your deadlines kind of thing, but same yeah. kind of idea, I yeah. guess. Um, 
but yeah, like you know what? Like yeah, if I if I did that, if I did the quicker part, I'd probably be doing pretty good. You know, so that's you know. Yeah, I think with indie authors, one of the tricks is to have like a lot of content. Absolutely, right? a lot of absolutely. Uh, Hey, you, what is there like a phrase for it? A lot of entry points or something? Is that what it, what you guys say in indie? Uh, I don't know. Just be, being prolific. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but yeah, it's the, you can have those different like gateway drugs. Like you can have your <laughs> your, your freebies and your ninety nine cent stuff and your you know free run that you do with the Kindle and everything. So yeah, it's absolutely true though. The more the more thumbnails you have on the virtual shelf, the more those things feed into each other, and you, you the next book sells the first book and breathes new life into the whole series. And it's, you know, that, it, you know, it is, a, it is a quickness game in a lot of ways. You know, that is, that is the game. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately, that's, that's the part I have kind of sucked at a little bit. But, um, but, you know, that's why we've talked about in another episode why I have gotten into the dictation technique. And I, I'm finally finding that, like, I can do something like that and, you know, write, I can walk around my neighborhood for a couple hours every day. I can dictate over 3,000 words that way and actually make really good progress on, on my stories. So That's a chapter a day. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, oh, wow. which, you know, I'm, I'm, I, when I sit at the keyboard, I'm kind of a slow writer because I, I do tend to want to edit my stuff a little bit, and I, I really like playing with the words, and I just, instead of just kind of going for it, which I could do when I very first started writing, but then the more I learned about how to write well, <laughs> the harder it is for me to just write crap. I, I have a really hard time writing crap. So by dictating, as I've mentioned before, it's I, I get the crap out. It just comes out, and I so, can't. So then, when, yeah. So then, when you type it, it's basically your second draft. Um, yeah, yeah. I do. I do make some um, tweaks when I type it in too. That's true. You know, so I, I fix a few things there, and then it's still going to be you know first draft ish, but like it works so much better for me. And so like I, that was key, finding a way for me to get faster, and it, and it, it, the dictation thing has been that thing, and so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We've talked about that before, but it's it's a really neat technique. Right. Um, so, uh, Joshua, we haven't heard from you yet today. What are what are your thoughts? It's um, it's pretty much the same for me in editing, and I think it works well for any business, uh, especially in publishing, to follow those same three rules. I try to be fast, I try to be good, and I try to be nice uh, to every person that I come in contact with, even the ones who I feel are just using me for a quick five-page edit. <laughs> Because you, you never know who they're going to be. You know, I, I will stand up for myself, of course, but I I do do my edits, and I I trust it to the general universe to send me people who are not trying to take advantage. Um, but that's how I was able to build my business relatively fast in you know the last few years here, and uh, get a huge client backlog and a huge backlog of work is by being fast by learning my stuff and being able to be a good editor and uh, by being nice to every one of them. Have you ever so, had any clients that yeah. just really ticked you off, right? And then what did they do to do that? That, that might be a good angle to tackle this from. So yeah, this one person uh, got in touch with me about a year ago with some sample of writing. Sample is really the best word I can come up with for it. It... Uh, it wasn't very good. And he kept sending it back over and over and over. Like, I'd send him notes, I'd do the whole thing for him, and then uh, send it back and give him notes, not just on what he sent me specifically, but about how he can improve writing in general. And uh, they'd take those notes and apply some of them, affix some of the things specifically that I said, to fix and then send the thing back. And this happened for like three or four rounds and each of my uh, edit editorial feedback would get shorter and shorter and shorter. <laughs> I'd do like two pages, one page, half a page. Until finally I said, look, you can't just keep sending me the same thing over and over again. What you need to do is you need to create a story. Here's how you can do that. Here are some good references and some good books that you can read on how to create a story. And then write it. I, I had the impression he wasn't even done with his story yet. So he was using me as a uh, as an alpha reader, essentially. Um, but yeah, even with that, I, I tried to handle it nicely, even though I was grinding my teeth. <laughs> um, because, you know, the world has enough negative energy out there. There are enough jerk-offs 
out there who are going to be jerk offs to you and just really make you angry. I don't see any reason to, if it's at all possible, to put more of that out there. For sure, not add any negative energy. Um, yeah, I had kind of an incident happen on the show uh, recently. Um, sorry, sorry, Jordan. No, I mean. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was about to go uh, talk about the marketing yourself. You know, and I can say this on the show because I'm certain he doesn't listen to it, this 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 person. They, <laughs> they, uh, uh, they emailed and said, oh, I'm an author. I have a new self-published book. Um, and I'm not saying self-published to be um, uh, denigrating at all, right? You know, I mean, there are some really great indie authors among us even. Um, so I'm always I'm always very careful to say that, but... But the fact that that no one has vetted it yet is is a, is a thing for me, anyways, right? Um, you know, authors that have sold a great deal, like like Moses, you know, that's that's a lot of vetting, right? You know, I mean, that's a good book, right? You know, and you know it's a good book because so many people have bought it, right? Self-published authors that were were very few people have uh, bought their book, and I checked this author's Amazon rankings, for me are in a different kind of class because nobody. Well, it's just you, you know you. It's a it's a platform, you know. He doesn't really have a platform yet, basically. Sure, sure, yeah. The there's no kind of yeah. independent verification that this person can write. Mm -hmm. um, in in any case, uh, they were like, "Oh, I, you know, hey, I am available to come on your show and be interviewed about my book." Right? <laughs> and um, you know, I mean, I we we don't Wait. interview people about books. We don't interview authors about books <laughs> on this show. We've done, you know, something like almost 30 episodes now and the only guest we've had so far although we do plan to have guests in the future the only guest we we've had so far is john klima from he was the hugo award winning editor of electric velocity and you know when we do bring on guests likely they'll be from areas that are outside of um actual writing we, we may bring on some authors but generally they'll talk about things that, other than their books Right, you know, we we. Right. Well, th well, that's the thing. The point is, he he contacted uh, you uh, to say promote me when we don't yeah. do that. So uh, um, you know, basically, if, yeah, you, you're not willing to even listen to the show. You don't want to invest the time to listen to a couple of episodes to get the feel for the show. Why should we invest our time in you? And that's something that you got to remember as an author in general is that when you're asking somebody to do something for you. They're investing their time, which is their most precious commodity, you know, and, and huge best-selling authors, their time is worth more because they can make more money with it, right? And, and not just time, but, but your, kind of your reputation yeah. as well, uh, basically. And, and you were talking about that um, obliquely with the, the platform and the standing stuff. Um, I have some notes here. Yeah, I actually did notes this time. Um, like when you're marketing <laughs> yourself, um, you, you don't... Uh, approach bloggers or podcasters or authors saying, will you help me promote my book? Unless they have a policy mm -hmm. of doing that. Like, okay, like John Scalzi is a, a great example. He has this big idea, uh, which is great. I mean, it has huge reach, but he also has guidelines and you have to go through those guidelines and, and, you know, follow the directions uh, to submit something for the big idea. And he, he has, uh, you know, standards, etc. on there. Um, there are several other bloggers and popular authors who will uh, have something about up and coming authors or new releases, that sort of thing. And that's fine. You so you can submit to them following their guidelines, but you don't just go up to some uh, uh, well-known blogger and say, hey, will you promote me? Because it's kind of crap. Um, same thing. You don't post on someone else's Facebook page promoting your book. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a big one. I've, I've deleted wow. a few of those. Yep, yep. Yeah. I, I've deleted, you know, one guy who was very, like, you know, very prominent uh, type of author. And, uh, yeah, just immediately I'm like, oh, you don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> this is uncool. This when is I do that, cool. it's like, sorry, it, it, I, I have it, approached people and, like, basically cold called them like that. But what I do is I get mm -hmm. to know them and, and their platform. And I think to myself, how can I help them and add to their platform and deliver something of value to their platform? And, you know, I mean, it's the same thing with running a press release. When you're running a press release to send out to a newspaper, you make it look like a story, right? So that it would, you know, be published in their newspaper like you're an actual reporter. And then it just so happens that many of the examples that you cite are, are whatever you're promoting, right? Well, yeah, it's mutually exactly. beneficial. Um, like, okay, good example is, uh, Jordan, when you approached me about doing this <laughs> podcast, 
Okay, I, I, my free time is, is really limited, but you, you, had a, you had a good approach. You said, okay, here's the idea. We're going to do this podcast. It's about this. We'd like you to be a part of it. It would be a time commitment of about this much. Um, and basically, <laughs> you said, I will do all the work, <laughs> and, uh, which is great. So I just have to show up. And, and I took it seriously because it was a very professional, well-thought-out approach. Uh, it's like, okay, you know what? I've never thought about doing a podcast before, but this is not a bad idea at all. Uh, and so, Thank yeah. You. Yeah, plus, stuck plus, with me now. Well, Jordan, Jordan, you know he gets he gets around a lot, so he's also heard a lot of stories about you from the cons. So he had enough, <laughs> he had enough material on you to be like, well, uh, okay. I could tell the story, and then that story, yeah. and then that. So you know, there's enough people know about me already. I think I'm unblackmailable at this point. No, I did think you know either you host the show or it will be about you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do they say? Um, as long as they're talking oh, about true. you, there you go. <laughs> bad publicity. Uh, yeah. Although that brings me around to another t- uh, topic. We've talked about um, how not to market yourself and and don't be a dick and and we've kind of um, touched on meet your deadlines that sort of stuff. Trash mm. talking. Don't trash talk anyone. Even if other people are trash talking, please don't pile on. Don't in that mob mentality uh, unless you have a, a, a basis or a standing for whatever it is yeah. you're saying. Uh, but yeah, it, very uncool to trash talk anybody in the industry because you just never know how that's going to fall out. You're never going to know who hears it and how they're going to interpret that. Yeah, somebody has to fight those Jordan. battles. Sure, right? But why does it have to be you, right? You know, like yeah, somebody has uh, harassed somebody at a con. Right, that's terrible. Right, we don't want that. Right, the con committee needs to be responsible and take care of that and make it a safe environment for everybody. But yeah, it's, it's one thing. It's one thing to speak up and say, "Yes, I support yes. The, these policies." Uh, we don't want to do a dog pile because that's counterproductive. Well, yeah. Uh, um, but and but yeah, and also uh, things like if you have an issue, if you have an issue with a publisher or another author. Uh, venting in public is not the way to go about doing it. Uh, there are procedures. There's protocols. Um, at least. Try those first because, you know, people make their own interpretations. There's a amount of research that says that yeah, whatever it, it, you say about a person, a third party, um, w- that the person that's listening to you will ascribe those qualities to you in, in part, right? So if you say, yeah. geez, this Joshua guy, he's, he's such a jerk and stuff, right? Like people won't, you know, I mean, sure, they might think Joshua's a jerk, but almost certainly they'll think that I, I'm kind of a jerk as well. Gosh, you're, you're a jerk, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a what a dick. <laughs> yeah, I actually I actually experienced something similar to this um, pretty recently on Facebook. Like there were there was there were two groups uh, within my my friend network who started going at each other, and I became aware of this, and I sort of like looked at one side, and I read a bunch of their posts, and I looked at the other side, and I read a bunch of their posts, and I couldn't decide who was telling the truth and who was being a jerk. So I, I ended up actually just unfriending all of them because I didn't want any of that mess to come anywhere near me. That's probably a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, were, there was a lot of name-calling, a lot of, like, uh, they stole this, they stole that. No, they stole this. No, they're bothering everybody. They're coming with false profiles and blah 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 Oh, that's sad. I mean, yeah. life's, too, life's too short. Good grief. Yeah, so some of my thoughts on this topic then. I mean, if you're listening to this podcast and uh, you're thinking about getting a literary agent, if you have not <clears throat> been kind of deflowered around the, the notion of literary agents being, like, the most wonderful people ever, um, <laughs> be very careful. There are a lot of bad agents out there. Um, not uh, Joshua Bilmus. His Twitter handle is at Awful Agent. He's, he's good. Joshua, if you're listening, pick me. <laughs> Someone who's a good agent for someone else is not necessarily a good agent for you. So true, true. Uh, but but if you haven't been kind of deflowered around this notion yet, check out. Um, you can go to Dean Wesley Smith's blog. He did a whole series on killing the sacred cows of publishing, and just it, it's a great point of view. You don't have to agree with him on everything, but it, just to get the other side of the story, because so many authors come into this field, and the first agent who wants to dance with them, they they, they sign up with. And I've just heard so many, so many, so many awful agent stories from some very smart people from some very good authors and uh, that you know one thing not to do in publishing is to just hook up with any old agent who wants to sign you and not do your homework and, and all that good stuff because that's a huge topic and they can really screw your career just as much as they can help you um, and if you yeah, especially if you're independent and you know you think about advertising I have a <clears throat> I have a friend who spent 
I think a lot of money on the wrong kind of advertising. There are good kinds of advertising. You can have advertising through like targeted ebook websites, which are you know places like e-reader news today, which is a place where <clears throat> people who want to buy ebooks, you know, get their updates and, and find out what kind of books to buy. What you don't necessarily want to do is spend like you know three thousand bucks on a big banner on some big popular website that's not really specific to people who buy ebooks. Even if it's like a science fiction website, you don't want to drop a ton of cash on that because you're not going to get anywhere near your return on your investment for that. You'd have to have absolutely money to burn if you're going to do that. And, and I've, I've talked to people about this who then went ahead and did it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you can't help people, but, um, but that's one to be really careful about. But, you know, do spend money on the good places to advertise, and you can really try to do your homework on those and research those. We've talked about that before um, on the podcast. So you can go back and listen to, like, all of our shows, and then you know, you'll get it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, just one other thought, you know, it's, it's funny going back to some of the old shows when David Dalglish was the the indie guy on the show uh, back before you guys got stuck <laughs> with me, and he, he had talked about uh, probably the one thing that's been said on the show that but probably haunts me the most to this day. Uh, you know, he had mentioned at one point that that when books come out um, on Amazon and they start off with like, you know, f- say five or so good reviews, like five star reviews, they start off with some good reviews it tends to really propel the book's momentum a whole lot more and it's Amazon's algorithms that probably have a lot to do with that um, and like around that time I noticed David would have a new book come out and he would, he would immediately have those reviews. Uh, David had the advantage of having a huge fan base so he could he could, you know, actually, you know, I know that people write him, you know, they'll write him fan letters, and he's at times written them back and said, hey, you know, would you mind writing an Amazon review if you don't mind? So, you know, he was able to tap into his fan base to get those right away. Um, but it, it's something to do if you're, if you're independent. Make sure you've got some people who can write some reviews, whether you have to give out review copies. I mean, don't have your mom and your friend and your sock puppets <laughs> do it. Uh, although, then again, there are people who do that, and they make a lot of money. So, you know, uh, but do find a way. I would say find an ethical way to do it. Find real reviewers writing honest reviews and have that come so that when you release a new book, you don't have it just come out with not much happening you know, with it. That's really, really important if you're independent. It seems to help with the Amazon algorithms you know, quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to throw it back to you guys to talk a little bit, and then we'll go to some quick closing thoughts. Um, I'm just going to hit out two as an inquiring editor, um, which is another of my hats. Um, and then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to throw a third one out at you guys. So very quickly, um, do not respond to rejections, right? Yes, yes, agreed. You know, Lord. <laughs> but, you, but you should take them very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, already, we already covered this in another show about, about rejections. Just I've had you know, authors send me rejection letters that I've wanted to publish in the place of their original story because it was so brilliant. And there are there are authors that I just wouldn't publish because I, I, they have a reputation of responding to rejections in an awful format. Um, <laughs> don't list every single publication you've got in your query letter. Like, I, you know, sometimes we we get these wall of texts, you know, and it's 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 literally like every kind of micro press around that they've published a story in, right? And that yeah, yeah. You, basically, you want to pull out your like your best two or three. I published in this, 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 and many yeah, better others. Better yet, even or something like is, that. is the yeah. two or three that that match up very well to that market, right? So right. if you have a bunch of credits um, and it's a mystery market that you're submitting to, give them mystery credits, right? Not you know fantasy or science fiction or whatever, right? Um, you know, because one thing that we notice, if you're just publishing in micro presses and you have seven million publications, we think, well, why are you not getting picked up by the pros? Are you not evolving as an author? Something that I look for as an acquiring editor, it's every editor's, I think, dream to publish somebody right at the start of their career, right? And, you know, we've been fortunate enough to do that. Um, I'm not going to drop any names right now, but um, check out Everyday Fiction. We have fairly, you know, big names back before they were popular. Anyways, um, so so the only way we can do that is if you evolve as an author, right? So if you're not evolving as an author, you know, and, and your story is as good as somebody who's been around for a long time, you know, like maybe we're going to go with the guy that's going to, we feel like he has, he or she has a career in front of them. Um, anyways, uh, the last one that I want to throw out to you guys is um, don't write reviews, right? Don't, don't review other people's books under your actual author name. 
right? And there's several reasons for this. First of all, Amazon um, has been deleting reviews written by anybody with an Author Central account recently. I'm not sure if that's a trend that's continued, but several of my author friends have said oh, all my all my reviews have disappeared. And uh, Amazon is is saying because you're an author, um, there's a lot of authors that have been writing and re sorry, writing reviews of their friends' books. Amazon is trying to crack down on that, so they were trying to remove them. But yeah, because people only have authors exactly. and friends. So. Well, I mean, no, I mean that <laughs> it's not very logical. No, it but yeah. happens a lot, you know. Like all of a sudden, one of my friends' books went from like forty reviews to two. Right. So <laughs> wow. there is a kind of circle circular motion happening with mm -hmm. Amazon reviews. Um, you know, and then uh, the other thing is if you write a bad review of somebody's book, even if it's somebody that you think you will never meet, they will haunt you. They'll remember your name, right? I remember the name of uh, this one guy in my Writers of the Future um, <laughs> book, I, the, the, the anthology that I, that I won Writers of the Future, and every other review said, oh, this guy's great, he's, you know, stand out and stuff this one review um said oh the the book is sorry this is an uninspired uh story with a terrible ending or something right and you know i mean sure he's right he's got a right to his opinion but i i, I remember that guy that guy's an author i've seen him in circles right <laughs> i'm just not going to do him any favors right you know it's just it's petty and it's mean and i'm a bad person but but, but humans are yeah. petty and uh and you just you just never you know, know. Yeah. you know it's one of these no good can come of it kind yeah. of things i'm with you i don't i don't uh yeah, yeah somebody stops you in the uh, face. Are you really going to go, like, you know, help them across the street or, or whatever? It's just a natural thing, right? If I, I have a lot of people asking for help f from me, right? And and if one of them has slapped me in the face, then I'm going to go with the other guy, right, or the other the other person. Um, what do you guys feel about that, Moses? Is is circular <laughs> reviews are they like a big problem? What what do indie authors do? Um, I, yeah, I. I... I agree with you in not writing bad reviews of other authors' books. I, I don't do that. That's my policy. Some people do. I, yeah, I don't know. You can do that at your own risk. But um, I, I do. I do occasionally write positive reviews of other books if it's an honest review. Um, I actually don't read all that much. I'm just busy with my own books, you know, and, and other things. So, uh, but I, I do occasionally write. An, uh, if I can really write an honest, good review of another bo book, I'll do that. I knock on wood. I haven't had any of my reviews deleted, uh, and. I remember Amazon has done these purges, and again, knock on wood, like when they've done these purges, I know people who said, yeah, I went from 40 to two reviews, and my books haven't lost reviews. Uh, whereas I know people who have these kind of shady connections going on where they have <laughs> lost reviews, <laughs> like this one author collective where they would all, they were all part of the same sort of like publishing thing, and they all reviewed each other's books, and then, oh, they all lost all the reviews of each other's books at one point, which was absolutely the right thing for Amazon yeah. to do. Um, you know, but... You know, so far I haven't been hit by those because I'm, do, I'm not doing anything like that. So, um, yeah. So I don't know. I I, I I understand. Like, you know, my my thing is if if Amazon wants to delete that review that you wrote of someone else's book and it's a positive review, fine. You know, uh, but I don't know. So I, I still write them occasionally. Personally, I actually think it's a little bit of good karma. Again, if it's honest, it's like, yeah, I really like that book. There's a book called Scriber by Ben S. Dobson, and if you go to his, which is one of my favorite fantasy books easily, uh, maybe my favorite. In fact, the title of the review says, maybe my favorite fantasy novel, seriously. <laughs> um, and my review is the top, you know, most voted, most helpful review on that. 23 or 24 people found it helpful, and, you know, and at the very end of it, I say, Moses Sierra the third author of The Black God's War, and I explain in the review that, yes, I am also an indie author, however, really, I really like this book um, and I don't know it, it's I don't think I think a little good karma is, is a good thing too just just golden rule you know again not like hey I'll help you you can <laughs> you help me it's not like that it's just no I really like this book um, so I don't know it, it, whether to review yay or nay it's always a personal thing that authors will disagree on the finer nuances of that I think so you gotta find what works Doesn't for you, I think. you in a, and let's sorry. just let's just say don't buy reviews don't buy reviews for sure Moses, doesn't it put you in a yeah. difficult situation, though, if you are willing to do reviews? Um, you know, somebody says, oh, could you review, sorry, could you review my book? And um, it turns out it's terrible. Doesn't that put you in an awkward situation? I, I, I just write them and say, you know, I, 
Uh, awkward? Perhaps, yes. But, you know, I'll just say, I, I don't know. I, I might just say, I might not ever mention that I finished their book. Or if I know them really well, I might be like, you know, I couldn't write the review as a five star. It would have to be a four star or it have to be a three star. And do you want me to write the review or something like that? I don't know. I just, I just manage it like that. It just hasn't really been a problem. Diana, have you, do you have any thoughts on that or? Um, I think I've pretty much blabbed um, most of them already, about and you know, interrupted and talked over people because you know, it's no, what I, I do. About writing reviews. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I, I don't yeah, interrupt. I'm writing <laughs> Sorry, reviews <I> specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, doing that on purpose. Um, I I don't I don't write um, reviews of other books. Um, I like not on like Amazon or Goodreads. If I read a book and I like it, uh, I'll pimp it um, in my own way. Uh, I don't ever say negative things. I, I just feel no good can come of it. I'm not a reviewer. I'm a writer. Um, but yeah, if I if I like a book, I'll go on Twitter and say, wow, I love this book. Y'all should read it. Or Facebook, whatever. But that's a completely different uh, dynamic. And that's basically me giving like a mini blurb kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, and, and I've heard the argument of like, well, authors give give blurbs and they put blurbs in other people's books and that's kind of like a review. And that, it is different. different. I, I, it's, I, it's I, because it you're is. not saying something bad and, you know, this, you're, you're endorsing something. An endorsement is not the same as a review. Uh, yeah. So, it, yeah, like when I go on Twitter and say, I just read this great, you know, you know, Regency romance thing, because it's something completely out of my genre too, um, I'm endorsing it. Yeah, I'm thinking of like uh, Name of the Wind. It used to be, let me go to, but the top review used to be by, I think, Robin Hobb. And, you know, and I've seen, you know, Brent Weeks uh, has like the top review on some of his friends' reviews. Yeah. Yeah. The first Amazon review on Name of the Wind is by Robin Hobb, you know. And so, again, to me, I, I think there is a bit of a blurry line between I'm endorsing your book and here's a, a, a blurb for the cover versus, yeah, I wrote an Amazon review because I liked the book. I, I absolutely agree. Not, I, I don't. Yeah, I would not do anything negative to another author to hurt their reputation. Uh, it's just not my place to do that. But again, authors disagree on finer points of reviews, and it, it's one of those subjects. It's like religion or politics or something. I don't know. You just, yeah, you never, there's lots. There's lots of different attitudes. You're never going to get agreement on it. Um, there are just a couple of points that I wanted to touch on business wise. Uh, first of all, I see this a lot. I see a lot of writers looking at the market and then studying what's on the bestsellers list and then trying to identify that trend and then jump on it. But I think a good rule of thumb uh, to keep in mind is that if you're looking at the market and finding the trend and then jumping on it, you've already missed it. Because by the time that you've identified what whatever trend is trending and then written a book to match that, it's already not popular anymore. You've missed the boat. Um, on the other if I may, Joshua, you know, yeah. or if you're independent and you can write it in a month or two and get it out there, you haven't missed the boat. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you can write it in a month or two, you more power to you. Anyway, um, go ahead. Go ahead. If, on the other hand, you ignore what's trending now, uh, you may end up with something that agents and editors are looking for, like a fresh voice, a new story. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And another thing that I have noticed personally is that there are submission guidelines out there. Find those. And then once you find them, do everything they tell you to do. It's not a list of options. Uh, do everything they say, even if you don't for some reason agree with all of them, because it's not about your preferences. It's about finding a job. Um, note that just because it doesn't expressly say not to use colored paper on a hard copy submission, that you should then go ahead and use colored paper. <laughs> just don't ever do that. Jordan, I, I think that you must have some dealings with this. I know I do. I, I want manuscripts submitted to me in industry standard, formatted to industry standard, and you'd be surprised at how often that doesn't happen. Yeah. Now, for me personally, it's not a huge draw on my time because I can just go in there and I can usually reformat the whole thing in about you know half a minute, 30 seconds or so. But submitting to editors who work for a market, it's a different story, right? Yeah, I, I always look at it like as a writer, you're a vendor and it's just like selling oranges, right? And if you give somebody an apple and they're looking for oranges, they're going to be like, oh, an apple. It mean, still tastes kind of good and stuff and maybe we'll try the apple if... If I know the person selling it just sells the best apples in the world, right? But I was really looking for an orange. So, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. bye-bye. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to uh, bring back up, you, you mentioned Jordan platforming uh, a minute or two ago. And uh, don't wait to build your platform. Get working on your base of people who are interested in you and following you. And... Uh, get an audience of people who want to hear about you and from you. 
uh, get that sphere of influence started. Um, and, you know, maybe that could be based off of whatever you do in your day job or a hobby that you've become well known in. But use wh- whoever you have around you when you start writing and, and start getting books out there and maybe write for that audience or utilize that audience so that they can spread the word about you. Um, but on the other hand, be very careful about promoting yourself when you don't actually have anything to promote. So there's a, it, in writing, there's always just this very, very fine balance between things. So make sure that you're working on your platform, but don't spend all your time working on your platform. You know, don't don't be on on Facebook updating your your status post every few minutes to see you know who else you can attract. Yeah. Uh, I think it, you'd be more successful spending your time actually writing a book. Like, who's the more successful author? An author with one great book and 30,000 Twitter followers or the author with a half dozen great books and 5,000 uh, devoted fans? Good question. Right? Who will share and link and, and everything. And So just keep writing. I'm sorry. I was updating my Facebook. What did you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I was actually... I was, I was just, I was just, I just saw this picture of a cat. And it was just, I tweeted about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's um, funny because I was actually reading somebody else's post too. Just now, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, th- I think we're going to move into some uh, closing thoughts. Um, I, I'll go first because I uh, just wanted to mention a couple things Joshua had, had uh, just talked about. I, I just want to clarify on the trend thing. I mean, I said if you can write it in a month or two and get it out there, okay, that works, which was a little bit tongue-in-cheek. But, but it, you know, I, I think of Amanda Hawking, who you might have heard of, like, this Twilight series, right? And then she wrote books with like vampire romance type stuff, and now she's doing pretty good. She so worked off. she works her absolute butt off to do that too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, she's she's a consummate professional from the beginning. Absolutely. So yeah, Amanda. Obviously, she did everything right. Everything that you, you should do. She, you could you could study her, make her a case study of what to do. Um, but she did jump on a trend, and you know sometimes the trends last for a while. I'm not a trend type of writer. I I kind of do my own thing, but. A lot of people can write to trends, and sometimes they've already passed. Sometimes they haven't. And and when you are independent, you can get the stuff out there faster. So that is one thing that you you know you may you may be able to to still catch a wave. Um, and then on you know building platform, Joshua was talking about too. And and I think at the end you, you know you kind of you know you kind of hit it right that you got to find the right balance with all these things. Um, I, I also want to say that if you are the type of person who is not good at building platform. Um, you can be successful by writing a lot of really good books and getting them into the, you know, just putting them out there, finding some maybe some bloggers who are going to write about it or something like that. Like, you don't have to be a platform author if you can write well, write fast, and, you know, just find a way to get your books out there a little bit. Uh, so, because some, some people hear that and they think, oh, man, I don't want to be social and I don't want to do all that. I don't, I don't think you have to do that. But then if you don't do that, I think you have to write well and write fast. Yeah, maybe that's a fourth leg so, of the triangle. <clears throat> maybe for yeah. indie authors, that's that's especially pertinent or something. Maybe it should be a square for indie authors. But what what would be the fourth uh, promotion? Point? Right, you can you can promote, but don't over promote or something. Right. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That could okay. be a subheading under "Don't be a dick." <laughs> <laughs> so, final thoughts. Uh, I'll go to Joshua first. Okay. Uh, my final thought is: don't skip on editing. Because editing is super important, you know. Find someone who you can trust, who will uh, not only help with all the grammatical crap, but a person who will be in your corner and help you make the best story, the best product that you can make. Someone who will uh, help you see the forest for the trees, or, or vice versa. A good content editor can push your story from feeling more amateurish to feeling very professional. So, don't skimp on that. Yeah, I feel like this is one of those episodes where the thing we don't say that's obvious, you know, people could be like, well, gee, they talked for 40 minutes and didn't even mention <laughs> you, you have to write a good book. Or, you know, <laughs> so, but you don't. So, you don't have things- to write a good book. There, we said it. You know, there are tons of horrible <laughs> books that succeed wildly. So, <laughs> anyway. It, it is true. That could, um, that could be a, another show of uh, uh, why did these horrible books yeah, succeed. Yeah, there you go. But. <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of things that we are not saying because our time is limited. Uh, and then I'll go to you, Jordan. Well, I, you know, I think a huge one is don't sign a contract you haven't read, right? I, I just don't have any sympathy for authors that write notes saying, oh, my publisher uh, screwed me up in somehow, or, you know, 
or don't sign a contract you don't understand. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's just tons of resources on the web about, about contracts. Run it by a friend, right? It, another author friend might be able to give you some advice kind of privately. You know, it's just... And even if you don't want an agent, you can hire um, a literary attorney just to debate the contract. Yeah, there you go. I mean, if it's a larger amount, sure, because a literary attorney will cost you a couple hundred bucks kind of regardless. Mm-hmm. So if it's maybe a novel contract, sure, that doesn't work for short stories. But, um, yeah, so, you know, just don't... So if you feel like you're in over your head, you know, reach out for help. There's a lot of stuff out there. And Diana? The lovely um, Diana? <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, echo what you said, Moses, about uh, trends. In a general advice, yeah, you, you don't... Um, don't hop on a trend, but sometimes you can, um, especially if you have, uh, if you're already established enough where you don't have to waste a year finding an agent and a publisher and stuff like that. Uh, if you're an indie author or, or someone like me, if a trend suddenly comes along uh, about panda bears, you know what? And if I had a good idea, I could write a panda bear book and it could probably be out in the next year. Um, zombie pan- panda bears, maybe. <laughs> oh, there you go. Look, yeah. looking for that. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it, people said that urban fantasy was a trend that would only last a couple of years, and it's, it's, it's stuck around for a while. So, Zombies uh, was supposed to be a trend, right? You know, and... Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, these become genres, and, and that means there's an <laughs> audience for these things, right? Yeah. And people want, do, you know, do me again the same way, do, do it again, right? <laughs> but whatever that phrase wow. is. Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I just like, I just like, do me again. That's how I have to say it. it but, not that kind of show. <laughs> <laughs> we keep saying that, but maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> Do what you did to me before, or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to sign off. Uh, we're all lovely. Joshua, you're lovely, too. I didn't want to exclude sure. you there. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think I think we've, we've blathered for enough uh, for today, and we'll catch you again next week. This has been another episode of Hide and Create. The show is produced by me, Jordan Ellinger. The site is edited by Joshua Esso, and your co-hosts have been Diana Rowland and Moses Sergar. That music that you're listening to was written by Jason Donnelly. We can be reached at writingpodcastonline.com, where you can ask us questions and suggest topics for future shows. Thank you for listening. Now go hide and create something.